Hello, everyone, and a uh, warm welcome on behalf of the McKinsey Center for Government. And thank you all for joining us uh, during these certainly very uh, intense and challenging times. Um, we want to acknowledge everybody who's working on the front lines of this pandemic um, and in the spirit of no navigating this crisis and challenge together, we would like to make a contribution throughout this web series from MCG around navigating COVID and rebuilding from there. In that spirit, we have a recurring series that I will convene twice per week um, going forward on Tuesdays and Thursdays with a revolving cast of topics where we do deep dive and build on the evolving uh, knowledge we have. on Today, we'll speak about uh, our NERF Center and overall MGI analysis we've done on the issue. And I would like to hand over to my colleague and the chairman of the MGI, who will uh, navigate us through the next 10 or 15 minutes or so before we then go deeper and also open it up for dialogue. If, if anything, we would like to contribute to the debate and advance the topic together. And therefore, it's important for us to also engage with you through dialogue in this series, and we'll make sure we make room for that at the end. Ben, over to you. Yep. Uh, we launched uh, this week a piece of work, an article, and a series of thinking around what we have called safeguarding our lives and with a on the line on the end, safeguarding our livelihoods. I hope you are all safe, that you can care for the people around you that need to have care. I'm here in Europe. I know you're across the globe. But in Europe, the exponential curve of the virus is getting closer. So we also individually start to see people that are touched by the virus, not just hear about it in the news. I'm totally aware of that. I also would like to thank you. Uh, for the efforts that governments are putting in, the government officials are putting in to safeguard the lives of our people, to care for it, and to do it with a vengeance and an intensity that is what's needed now. What I wanted to tee up from the work that we've done here is that we have been looking at the question of what happens while we're saving, guarding our lives. When we try to suppress the virus with all the containment efforts, be it physical distancing, be it um, the lockdown measures that are being taken, shelter in place, and whatever the names are for all the efforts, and the increasing intensity thereof, ranging from what has happened in Asia so far already to what's happening in Europe right now and the launch of all these initiatives uh, in the United States. We started to look at another dimension of this problem, and you can go to the next page if you want, which is that it also changes economic life, which is not so much about the economy, but it's about the livelihoods of people. And what we're doing now really is something that has never happened before, not in World War II, World War I, or any other event, is to send people home in many, many branches of society for weeks, if not months, to come. And if you model the effect of that, what you can see is, on a one-month basis, is when you send people home, tell them to get back to work later, whether that means that they don't have a job or they have a different job working from home, as you all are probably are right now, although in government I see some people still work on the distance because they need to be in the critical care functions. The economic shock that goes with that roughly follows this. People get very careful about what's called discretionary spending. They don't buy cars. Of course, they don't fly because we can't fly at the moment. Uh, they are not going to restaurants because we tell them not to go there, and so on. And the net net effect is a 50% reduction in discretionary spending. Imports and exports are changing, and investment is changing, and it is easily imagined that you reduce the economy in the time of a lockdown with 10%, not annualized, absolute. So if the economy was 100, you take it down to 90. The level of that shock, which I'm now modeling at one month, and we'll talk later about the scenarios, the level of that shock, you can go to the next page, is unprecedented. It's deeper than a shock, any shock since World War II, and deeper than the first quarter of the Great Depression. 
And while we're reading about the suppression of the virus, which is sort of the top end of this curve here, you know, flatten the curve, play it out, build hospital capacity, find cures, which is all of crucial importance. I have no doubt that the right thing is being done there. The associated shock that I described, depending on its duration, is of unprecedented scale too. So we have an unprecedented virus and an unprecedented economic shock. And it's our suggestion that it's the imperative of our time of this moment to time box both the virus and the economic shock. Not because we care about money, but because we care about the lives which we're dealing with already with the virus, and we care about the livelihoods of the people. Now, unprecedented efforts are being pursued by government also to support people and businesses affected by the lockdowns. There's helicopter money being discussed, support to businesses, debt moratoria, and the list goes on and on and on. Almost anything that you've ever considered impossible is being considered at the moment. Can we at some point in time get to a point that we can get back safely to somewhat of a normal life while the virus is not totally gone? You know, it's abated and the lockdown opens up, but that we prevent resurgence of the virus by still having a procedure. And our suggestion is in this imperative is that we need to time box both problems, the virus and the economic shock, protect lives and livelihoods. If you go to the next page, we spun up uh, nine scenarios where you could imagine a rapid and effective control of the virus on the vertical axis to a less effective to a failure of the public health interventions. And we're all looking at Italy, is it working? It seems to slow a little bit the last two, three days. That's good news. But is Italy as fast as China, Korea, or Japan, or is it different? Is it somewhat slower? Where will the US be? So that's the uncertainty on the vertical axis. At the same time, we're processing on the other axis, and that's the suggestion we make, the uncertainty of effective interventions in the economy. Will they basically cancel the negatives of the lockdown and we get into a V-shape, which China, Korea might be on, somewhat muted, or will we not be able to get to work safely in a good way and this thing will last longer. The current levels of scenarios between A1 and A4 is that you get this 10% shock and you're either back in six months, which would be the V-shape, or you're back in three months, three years. The difference between the two is enormous. And we should suggest while we race to suppress the virus, we need to prepare the race to get back to work. And why don't you go to the next slide for a second to just give a feel for it. Um, if you could, to the next slide, please. This is uh, the scenario with, uh, you know, a 10% shock and we get back. If you go to the next one, it can look much more ugly. We stay on there for a long time and even China takes longer to get back because they don't have the exports and the imports from the West. We're also doing unprecedented stuff to protect our people, safeguard businesses and so on, bailouts and everything is on the table. Let me take you one strange thing that I just heard. The German country, Germany, has decided that the cartel arms can basically release every industry from cartel policy if it helps to get stuff done. Who would imagine that? So it's very impressive things are happening. You see all kinds of stories of the innovation that's happening that maybe expands hospital capacity and so on. I spoke to the Minister of Education of one country and said, how do you get back to school? I, said, I don't know, but what if you would send one third of the children to school every two days and the other two thirds are home and you cycle through? Could that be possible? I don't know. We need to think about it. Could they then play a game outside when they're outside, which is not to touch each other, but basically to stay on exactly 1.5 meter distance or two meters. Would that be the game that the kids would be playing? And would that be enough protocol to stay distance and the kids can go back to school in the way they were used to? We need to start solving this question because if we don't, this economic shock will last too long. We wrote this article, article a week ago when the Wall Street Journal was talking that we might be getting to a trade-off between the lives lost from the virus and the lives lost from the economy. We believe not only that there must be another way, but there is another way if we work equally hard 
on suppressing the virus to safeguard our lives as we work to bring our livelihoods back and somewhat normalcy of doing our work. That to us is the imperative of our time. And with that, I'll pause, maybe take some questions or take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. One question, perhaps before we move to the next section that's come through. Um, what are the triggers we should monitor to assess which scenario is most likely? I'll take you back to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's a good question. Um, you would look at a couple of things. Are we comfortable that we have the testing, treatment, and hospital capacity, and maybe even some suppressing cures or treatment, so we can we can basically handle more patients? So that bottleneck gets resolved, which means that if we risk to go out and something comes back, we can still deal with it. That's one side. So you need the hospital side. The other one you would start to look at is, are people starting to feel that they can go back to work? Because when they feel they can go back to work, they will gradually start spending again. But if they feel this might last long, they will try to protect themselves. Thank you, Sven. With that, um, we'd like to pass on to Adi Kumar and Leah Pollock uh, to talk about the Nerve Center and government operations and how some of these decisions that Sven is discussing can be operationalized. Adi, Leah, over to you. Great, thank you, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, why don't we dive right in? Um, so uh, one thing that we wanted to talk about today was what we are seeing emerge across uh, governments around the world, which is how do you coordinate with a reality that involves so many different areas of government and involves people working together very differently. And so for today, we'll talk about um, that entity that we are seeing emerge across governments around the world. We call it the Nerve Center. Um, and then in subsequent weeks, we will be talking, uh, we will have webinars about some of the topics in particular that these Nerve Centers are talking about. So next week, we will be doing education uh, and healthcare. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, uh, folks can read uh, most of what's on here, and I will um, just hit some of the important points. Uh, we see these centers normally stood up when there is, you know, significant disruption, highly unfamiliar situation, very high velocity situation. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, governments stand these types of centers up uh, after a natural disaster uh, or after some other significant exogenous event uh, that occurs that disrupts normal government activity. Um, this one is quite different, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute, but, um, but to start with, we thought it was good to say, well, what makes up a successful uh, operating rhythm and a successful standing up and running at these centers? And a couple things we thought we'd hit. One is, uh, you know, if you look at the right side of the page, uh, and I'll just hit a couple of these, I won't hit all of them. One is this point of, you know, representatives from legal, regulatory, and other critical bodies. Uh, oftentimes, this is uh, highly overlooked because uh, the normal operations of government considers some of these functions to be uh, either on the, in the back office or a second or third step to a normal functioning of government. One thing we're seeing in several nerve centers is these folks are getting pulled in to be actually sitting at the table with the government leaders to be able to act immediately. For example, oftentimes what we are seeing in nerve centers is procurement leaders being able to be at the table with government leaders that are making decisions. So when a decision is made, the procurement can be placed immediately. And so that is one uh, key lesson is to think about the people that are around the table and uh, uh, think about the people who may need to be brought in who aren't always brought in. Uh, another, another kind of uh, critical element in terms of uh, successful structures of these things is how you use data and analytics. Uh, it is important uh, in these times where the answer is moving very quickly to always have a single source of truth. 
And this sometimes can be can, can be sort of countercultural to governments where there may be several data and analytics teams, different cabinet agencies are feeding the answers into different places, and there's healthy debate about what the right answer is. I think what um, needs to happen during these times and what we're seeing happen in successful nerve center operations is government leaders need to be able to not only benefit from the full breadth of data that occurs within the government, but needs to then figure out how to consolidate that quickly and have a nightly or a twice daily, uh, quickly repeated single source of truth through which to make decisions so everyone is staying aligned. Um, there are some other things on this page, but maybe we can keep going and uh, we'll talk about some of this in, in some of these other pages. So um, one important aspect uh, of nerve centers is this concept of coordinating across departments. And um, one thing we are seeing here is that a typical nerve center that might be set up for a typical kind of natural disaster, wildfire, tornado, hurricane, um, oftentimes is, you know, set up for this one very, very singular purpose. And that purpose, you know, is to kind of fix that disaster. And uh, that is what we are seeing happening in uh, these nerve centers that governments are setting up right now. There's this very, very strong medical response focus. And the core competencies of uh, the actual nerve centers around how do we save lives in response to what is happening for the virus. But we're seeing, and you see some of those core competencies here, what are we doing with testing? What are we doing with uh, PPE? What are we doing with critical care? We're seeing government leaders, uh, however, say, this thing is a lot bigger than just the actual medical response, um, and we need to think more broadly than that. And so uh, what we've seen in several instances is almost a concentric circle around the immediate emergency operations center. Uh, and that concentric circle represents what are the effects on education, what are the effects on technology, what are the effects on labor in the workforce, what are the effects on the economy, et cetera. And the question is, how can a government body most efficiently not only focus on the immediate and the urgent, but also then be building that second muscle to devote enough time to recognize the downstream consequences that occur based on what is those health and medical decisions, um, all the downstream consequences that occur on those. The, the one other thing that is important to hit here is that one thing we are seeing governments struggle with is this notion of what core competency is needed to run a successful nerve center. And one of the reasons we see this struggle occurring is because unlike many other crises, this one is evolving in phases that bring into uh, a very important place a changing core competency that is often required to run these things. So a lot of governments, um, and especially if you look at sort of where the U.S. Uh, is right now, just based on how the, the virus is traveling across the world, uh, a lot of U.S. governments, for example, have gotten very, very, uh, have built a very, very strong public health muscle that is running the nerve center, um, issuing guidance on hand washing, on social distancing, all the way to school closings and closings of restaurants and bars. And these are very, very tough decisions, but they are judgment calls that are made based on public health expertise. They are now moving to this area that requires massive competence in delivery system reform and delivery system onslaught and how to actually plan for a surge. And this is a huge, huge logistical operation. And one area that we are really seeing government struggle with is how do you evolve that core competency from, in this case, a very typical kind of public health core competency to a very, very sophisticated logistical core competency? And how do you make sure that your nerve center is fluid enough to be able to realize that it needs to evolve. Um, and so that is another thing to think about as you set things up is um, given the nature of this crisis and the prolonged effects that it has, there will be different phases where you need different leaders to be able to um, 
uh, to kind of start taking the reins in, in the operations of the nerve center. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. So uh, a few key elements here, and uh, for the folks on the WebEx, you can read several of these, and uh, maybe I'll just hit one or two. So uh, I just talked about number six, which is this is constantly changing. Um, and I talked about number five, which is uh, you need to streamline the hierarchy. You need the procurement person at the table. They cannot be three or four steps removed because procuring in this time of crisis uh, is highly important. Maybe the one other thing I'll hit here um, before we go to Q&A is uh, one other thing we are seeing governments struggle with is how do we always think about the next horizon? And Sven talked about the uh, you know, importance of at some point thinking about not just, uh, you know, saving lives today, but also changing, changing the narrative of we will come out of this. And, uh, and one thing that we are seeing government struggle with is how do you segregate a team that is focused on the future and focused on looking 30, 60, and 90 days out versus the SWAT team that is 100% focused on the here and now and saving lives today. And, uh, and this is a struggle because I think all of the energy moves toward the here and now and how do we save lives today. Uh, and we are seeing it be increasingly more critical for governments to segregate a team that can actually be thinking about 30, 60, and 90 days from now, and then to establish a strong connection to the core of the nerve center that is feeding that information in so today's activities can be um, executed on most appropriately, both in how they relate to what may happen in the future, but also taking into consideration those future effects in making today's decisions. Um, why don't we keep going, Taylor? I think that uh, we can go to Q&A. Great, thank you, Adi. And as a reminder to everybody, if you want to ask a question, you can use the, um, the Q&A uh, bar on the right-hand side of your console. Um, the first question that we'll take, I think, relates, Audie, to the, um, the overall structure of, of the Nerve Center and how it interacts with, with departments on this page. Um, does the dynamic change in the Nerve Center if, <clears throat> in fact, these example teams are pre-existing departments or if they're cross-functional teams or a mix of both? Perhaps you can speak to that dynamic and how it might differ. Leah as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so maybe I'm happy to start. And Leah, please feel free to jump in. So um, look, this this what we are experiencing here is is just uh, in the, the all. You know, I've probably talked to um, over a dozen government entities in the last week alone, and uh, and it has taken over the activities of government in uh, in a way few other things have. And um, we actually see kind of three levels of what you could describe as a nerve center. So one is the very, very, uh, you know, center of the storm emergency operation center. So we see this very, very core, uh, you know, center of the storm part of the nerve center. That requires massive core competencies from all sorts of different areas of government. We then see kind of government leaders oftentimes maybe getting together their cabinet, right, and saying, I'm going to appoint um, maybe a czar to overlook the whole of government response to this virus. Um, and that is a slightly broader group. Uh, and then we see basically several cabinet departments reorganizing uh, within the cabinet department to say, we are gonna have a SWAT team that is focused on this. And that could be the Department of Transportation saying, we're gonna have a SWAT team focused on this. It could, it could be the Department of Education saying, we're gonna have a SWAT team focused on this. So this can happen at three different levels absolutely the core competencies and the way of working, depending on the level that you are talking about, uh, is different. So at the center of the storm, you need to be a lot more focused on pulling together, on, on fighting against the oftentimes the natural proclivity of governments being often siloed entities. And you need to focus on pulling together very, very actively uh, leaders and experts, sometimes four levels down from where they may reside in the government and bringing them to the table. But for example, uh, in the Department of Energy or in the Department of Education, 
you are focused on solving education and the you know some of the important things there are to make sure you are bringing the right legal person the right functional person in um, but less so that you need to have a sort of whole of government representation within there the most important thing on these cabinet level nerve centers is to build the connective tissue between the other more central bodies and what you are doing so absolutely, I think the, the core competencies and the operating rhythm and the governance, you know, will differ a little bit based on uh, the actual uh, the actual nerve center body. Thanks, Adi. Um, a second question, again, related to how uh, we can go about this practically. What, what technology systems would you recommend, I suppose, speaking at a fairly generic level, but what technology systems would you recommend to support an overall nerve center operation? Or perhaps you can speak to different options as well. Yeah, and look, I, I won't name uh, I won't name particular software. Right, there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, off the shelf software that people use today to communicate that actually could be quite fine. Um, and you know, I can I'll name things that are just generally known that everyone knows. One is the single source of truth point. It is important to make sure that folks are. Uh, all using whatever you choose to use in order to communicate with each other. And, and sometimes this is even being very clear on things like what is communicated over email versus what has to be logged into a system every day versus what people are talking about on Slack channels and things like that. So it is very, very important to actually uh, hyper-industrialize the communication channels and how you are using technology. I would say the, the one other thing, the second thing, is do not overcomplicate it depending on, especially depending on what level of government that you are in. So I have um, uh, worked with several U.S. governments at the state level um, and uh, a couple at the city level also. And yes, these are complex operations, but I have uh, seen a lot of impact happen by uh, people who are setting up simple dashboards in Excel to track, uh, you know, uh, things in a very, very practical way. So uh, time is of the essence, uh, and I would say you do not need a, uh, you know, for, for a lot of things that, from a dashboard standpoint, or for a lot of things that actually need to get done on the ground, uh, you need not overcomplicate the technology aspect. Yeah, like Adi, this is Nav, if I may also add that uh, we would urge you not to focus too much on technology at the moment. Uh, the simple dashboards, simple hunting around Excel sheets can work equally fine. Uh, hopefully in a few days or weeks, uh, the technology solution can also work, but that should not be the limitation. There's a lot you can do without uh, expansive technology. Yes, in addition to the, the use of technology for operations, the other thing that's on the stage just to the right of medical response is the role of the nerve center in communication, which is one of the uh, critical roles that the nerve center plays is both collecting that information and making sure that there's the transparent, regular dissemination of, of the communication. And that's where I think we're seeing some very interesting application of technology uh, with, uh, you know, the use of social media groups and regular briefings and um, just a whole, uh, a lot of examples of technology being used to get the word out also in terms of contact tracing, really interesting uh, development of new apps um, to track the contact tracing as well as quarantine. So I would definitely say in terms of, yes, absolutely, don't overthink the technology for the actual operations, but there's a lot of creativity around this communications and other operations um, that, that we've seen innovation around. Leah, maybe we can um, uh, double click on communications for a second because we have a question um, about that in the Q&A. And the question is, uh, for government functions that require face-to-face -face public contact, um, so licensing visits, nursing homes, et cetera, governments have been typically slow to provide guidance and flexibility to this frontline staff, and there have been communication issues. Could we speak at all to um, examples you've seen about how this has been done well or any suggestions about how to communicate to the front line. Um, sure, this is Ophelia. I'm happy to think. There's a couple things that are really important as you think about those front lines. Uh, the first thing is around being very clear on messaging. So 
the more you can um, align on what the messaging is going to be and have minimally have to adjust it, but recognizing this is a really evolving situation. So being clear on what the standards and protocols are going to change. The second is really identifying the place where these individuals get information. So are there typical ways that you guys are already providing this information and thinking about how you can do them? However, you do need to ask about, is that channel too slow? And if that channel's too slow, looking for other creative ways that you can get that information. Um, Leah had mentioned social media and other ways like that is some of the key things that I would look at is both timing and clarity in that communication. Maybe I'll just add one thing is, um, I think where a lot of, uh, you know, as a government you leader, as a government leader, you have uh, a couple of responsibilities, to say the least. Uh, one is obviously solving this thing and helping society solve how we are going to deal with this. Uh, but the other is that you are uh, an employer, and you are an employer of often uh, a very large number of people. And so uh, the other thing I would stress on top of Ophelia's uh, comment is, to be ready for the incoming from the front line uh, and the incoming from the staff, the people who have questions up to you, um, and not and to be ready to not be overwhelmed. And so, um, you know, th this is a re reality even when dealing with uh, your citizens and and uh, the folks in your countries and your states. Is uh, you know, in this crisis, you will see call centers overwhelmed. Uh, you will see inbound overwhel uh, overwhelmed in terms of, uh, you know, email inquiries, online form inquiries, et cetera, the demand on government services like services for unemployment, et cetera. But make sure you are also thinking about the capacity to deal with the questions coming from your frontline staff and your frontline workers um, based on your own employment policies and how you are uh, treating uh, their jobs and their work. Thanks, Adi. Um, I think we have time for two more questions, so we'll uh, get one more question for Sven. Sven, are you um, are, are you on mute? I'm okay here. With her, us. I'm here. I'm Excellent. here. Um, so we we have a question about some of these big decisions that we're making um, as we we go through the two curves. Should you also be including long term issues like climate change in this planning? Um, can we make decisions that also consider um, our lives, our livelihoods, and the planet as well? Um, I think it's always better to make decisions that take the long term into account. Uh, in particular, the longer this shock is, uh, and you know, if you were to do stimulus and stimulate some stuff that actually is consistent with that future, that is better than if you stimulate what's maybe less inconsistent. But I do think that the shock that we're going through right now should be a little indiscriminatory between what people are doing today just versus the carnage that they're going to go through. So I believe the most vulnerable point I am, I think we should prioritize the most. But if we can prioritize for the future and these other big issues, I would do it. But the real reality is if we get out of this economy faster, we'll be able to deal with the future much better. And, and so there's some optimization that I would do. but. I would prioritize regarding the lives of those that are most vulnerable the first. I'm particularly worried in a global audience about what will happen in Africa, Latam, and India. And I think we're not even starting to process how it will unfold there. Thanks, for that. Um One final question, which is a bit more general beyond the, the nerve center or um, some of the, the economic and, and health considerations is about how we collaborate. So um, perhaps we can uh, bring up this page, uh, Adi, that you spoke to. On the right-hand side, um, we have a point that says links to major other external partners. What about industry participation? How do we ensure that the private sector, the public sector uh, are collaborating here, that there are links, whether it's through the Nerve Center or elsewhere, um, that the coordination body is, is, um, is effective and, and closely coordinated? Yeah, it's a great question. No, go on. Okay, um, and Nava, uh, uh, happy to start and then uh, hand it over. Look, it, this is actually a question we get a lot, uh, and it is a great question, and there are a lot of things to say here. 
So um, maybe I'll try to hit on what I think is the most important thing and the thing that I actually see governments fail at the most. So I think what is the most important thing here is to have a very clear, to establish a very clear picture as a government leader of what do you want from the private sector? What I have seen in over a dozen situations, you know, just in every kind of uh, nerve center operation I look at, uh, in every sort of crisis situation is there's a lot of incoming from the private sector. We want to help on this. We want to help on that. The CEO, if someone says, we can do this, we can retool our factory to make PPE. You know, um, I think I can retool my factory to make ventilators. Uh, there is so much incoming from the private sector and things like that. And I think that governments are trying to respond to this incoming without developing a, uh, real framework of how do we want to activate the private sector? What do we want and what do we not want so it doesn't add to the chaos? And I think that is actually uh, the first step that I would recommend a senior government leader who is uh, trying to run an operation in this time and who has set up the nerve center uh, to think about. If you have that kind of a framework, then you can start to actually deal with the incoming a lot more effectively because it will slot in somewhere. You may have someone then say, uh, this person is in charge of uh, dealing with private sector incoming from manufacturers who think they can retool their factory. This person is in charge of dealing with private sector leaders who are willing to uh, use their organizations to either donate or distribute critical supplies, food, et cetera, uh, during times of lockdowns or uh, stay at home orders. You, you can start kind of putting people in, uh, putting the private sector to work in a much more rational and impactful way um, if you develop a little bit of a structure of how to actually deal with the, the incoming. Um, I would then say one final thing, which is have very, very clear uh, lines of communication and almost li like lists, contact lists of who are your critical private sector partners that are helping you through this? So when you make decisions, you are communicating to them too. And for each important decision, you are activating and communicating to the right set of private sector partners. Because while governments may actually get the ability to coordinate amongst themselves uh, and do that quite well, which is also pretty hard, what becomes very, very tough is making sure that as you are moving and you are going to be moving fast, uh, you are getting the rest of the economy and you are getting the rest of non, the, the important non-governmental actors to be moving in lockstep with you. So proactive communications with actual lists and actual rules that say when we make decisions on this, we're informing the, these leaders. When we're making decisions on this, we're informing these other leaders. Be very proactive about it. Not go yeah. ahead. Yeah, and I would just add that I think there are some very like, tangible things you can do right away in case you have not. Uh, if you have not reached out to your local chambers of commerce, uh, your local business organization, uh, they all want to help. Uh, so I would say that is an uh, immediate thing to do. You have all kinds of regulations that are coming up. Translating that to what it means for for the, for the businesses is not an easy thing to do. If you can help them think through that here are the new laws coming through and they're coming at a rocket speed, they're coming one after the other. Here is what it means for you. Here is how you can use it. Here is what you should do that can go a long way also. So in case you've not reached out to your local business organizations, I would urge you to do so. And they are there to help, they want to help, and I would say uh, use them. And this is, this is Leah, I think one thing I'd add is um, Sven earlier was talking about, starting to talk about reopen and what that looks like when we uh, actually have, feel like there's effective containment, what is it gonna look like to take the steps towards having schools open again and having uh, non-essential businesses open again. And I think that's another area where already thinking through what is that, like audio, you know, not just the contact list, but very specifically, what are the safeguards uh, that you're going to put in place, the expectations that you're going to set for the different sectors uh, as you're planning for that over the next few weeks, really, that's going to take very close coordination with your private sector counterparts. Thanks, Leah. Um, I think we're just about at time, but I would like to pass over to David Fine, uh, the Global Leader for Public and Social Sector at McKinsey, uh, to close. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Taylor. <clears throat> and um, I think I just want to start off with 
um, you, you know, a note of gratitude uh, and thanks to everyone who's actually joined. Um, it's just been an unprecedented and unrelenting time. I haven't in my lifetime uh, ever seen anything like this with all the various crises that I've um, through my time at McKinsey seen, whether it's been the tsunami response or all kinds of issues. It's just extraordinary and I'm seeing many of my colleagues you know, their, their beards are growing, their hair is, aside from NAV, their hair is, is, uh, is kind of getting long and they're, you know, they're tired and they're working tirelessly and really demonstrating care. And I know many, many, many of our clients and, and public sector uh, people uh, on, on this webinar are just working extraordinary hours and it's to push back this tide. It's a tide, it's a relentless tide and we have to push it back. And we are pushing it back. And one, I just want to express gratitude. I think the second thing I just wanted to say was, you know, what you would have heard today was two things. At a meta level, at a strategic level, there are six things that you have to worry about. And I think if there's one thing we can leave you with, there's the curve at the top. There are three things that matter. There's a curve at the bottom. There are three things that matter. And, you know, at a strategic level, the more you can sort of converge energy towards that, the better. And the second is, as you've heard, there's just a massive amount of energy coming together. And the question ultimately is how do you convert that energy and that enthusiasm and all those offers into impact? And unlike, you know, other situations where uh, perhaps there's only been one component to worry about, there are many. So hopefully what you'll take away from today is there's six things and there is a process one has to follow to converge energy and enthusiasm into impact and if we do that on both let me call it the health side and the economic development side then we will move the tide and we can get to that more optimistic scenario which is critical for many people i do want to just say one last thing which is we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the economy and i think we will be have well we will be having these webinars on a regular basis and we'll be getting to the economy this for me is the most complex issue that we have to deal with. On one hand, we have, you know, the corporates who have to kind of get the engine going, but we need the SMEs and the, uh, who are ultimately the most vulnerable uh, and ultimately many of whom will drive also that consumer confidence to move. This is a non-trivial issue. And as we go forward, we'll also start to shift on to other topics, which I'm seeing in the Q&A we haven't addressed, like education, social work, how does one think about fiscal management? How does one think about economic development? And uh, we'll get to those. But uh, again, thank you so much. And I'm just extraordinarily grateful. Uh, you're in my house. I'm sure we're all in your house and uh, many times. And, um, uh, you, you know, so, so um, thank you so much for joining and, um, and take care.